Hi, I'm Pilgrim Beert of Device Pilot, and today I'm very pleased to welcome Peter Bantz of Origami Energy. Hi, Peter. Hi, Pilgrim. Pleasure to be here. So it's lovely to see you again. We, we go back quite a way, don't we? Um, but can you just tell everyone about a little bit about how you got into smart energy? Because this isn't your first energy gig, is it? No, it's not. I mean, even growing up in Canada, you know, enjoying the outdoors and nature all around me, that's really where clean energy, sustainability, nature, the environment sort of got in the blood. Um, so it's been a lifelong passion of mine. But uh, since training, technically, I did a PhD in physics when I came over to the UK from Canada, you know, technology has been the driving force of my career. So suddenly, I can now apply both, you know, my, my passion for the environment and my skills in technology and business building. And that's what I'm doing now. So yeah, since I came over to the UK, I, I realized I did not want to work in, in, in academia. So I, I launched myself into the world of business. And, uh, and you're right that I've gone through a few different iterations as we all do, but the common thread has been technology as a, as a, as a power to transform uh, the energy system to be greener, more sustainable, more dynamic, et cetera. So yeah, I, I had to, my first gig as a hired in CEO of a venture that I, I grew over several years and in fact took public on the, on the stock market, on the AIM market in London. And then, you know, that was hard and exciting and fantastic, but also, you know, uh, quite an up and down ride. And then I needed a, a bit of a break. So I, I worked uh, for two or three years at a London-based investment company that was investing in both digital startups, you know, digital digitization tech as a power for transformational change, but not in energy, interestingly, as well as they're investing uh, uh, billions into physical assets. In this case, it was green energy stuff, mainly ground mount solar, but surprisingly nothing in the overlap. So, so really that's why I founded Origami when uh, I thought this the interplay between you know, the physics of energy assets and the economics of markets needed digital glue in the middle. And that's what became origami. So that brings me to the present. Yeah, very interesting. So, so we live in a world of huge change where our whole energy infrastructure is being turned almost sort of inside out. And, and from having a very centralized um, generation of power, we're moving to a world where a lot of generation is happening in a decentralized way. And we also need assets at the edge that can be controlled so that they can, they can take what power is currently available. Um, and, and that's a very different, different world. So in that world, you know, what is, what is the, the, the role of our origami? energy? I mean, are you, are you providing some kind of, of marketplace for energy or, or are you a market actor or are you a technology provider? What's, what's your sort of role in the market? Yeah, great question. So the quick answer is we are an out-and-out -out technology company. We provide technology uh, to our customers and they are actors in this increasingly green energy system. So we made a very, very conscious strategic choice as all businesses do when they're growing up, they're trying to figure out who are we really, you know, who, where are we really going to focus and be world-class and you need to focus in order to be world-class. We decided not to try and create a marketplace which you know, matches buyers and sellers, neither to be a market actor and trade our own book using our own technology and make bets ourselves. We decided to invest in, in, in very powerful picks and shovels, not in the gold mine. Um, so really that was why we decided to focus on building an increasingly powerful, highly modular technology platform and offer that platform to our customers who were gonna make bets in the market, either asset-centric kind of companies that, develop energy projects, whether those are big solar farms or battery projects connected to the grid or behind the meter on, you know, on site in buildings or elsewhere, or they're more market centric actors that are trading power, managing risk, that kind of thing. So you know, we made a very, very conscious strategic decision to uh, be a technology company and offer our technology platform as a service to energy businesses. Okay, so so just to make sure I've got that clear in terms of who your customers are, they could be people who own assets or people who buy or sell energy to asset to assets. Is that is that right? Or yeah, there's a really interesting trend that we're seeing in the market. It's a really big shift. If you wind back the clock just a few years ago, there was quite a a polarized um, uh, market design where. Uh, project developers that raise capital, manage physical supply chains, built you know, green energy assets, think like solar farms and wind farms and so forth, you know, they, they, they effectively handed over almost entirely the, the, the role to provide routes to market and monetization and control and to a third party, a provider of PPA or route to market or trader, depending 
you know, how they were positioned in the market. So the use of technology was very skewed, but now that historical distinction is blurring, you know, almost entirely, you know, you end up with uh, a companies building out fleets of green energy assets, either on site, uh, you know, behind the meter or, uh, or connected to the grid somewhere. And they're using technology themselves in a very big way now, either to monitor what's going on, you know, seeing real time data streams and figuring out are our assets doing what we expected? Uh, also deciding what they should be doing, again, increasingly real time to help uh, uh, monetize those or even change the route to market provider increasingly frequently, not just lock a deal in and then forget about it for years and years and years. So, so the, 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 the visualization, the decision-making and the action is increasingly being taken on by the asset owner operators themselves, not relying entirely on market actors that traditionally have provided a fully integrated you know, service. Uh, and, and for us, what that means is a, 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 a techie geeky kind of company is the, the open architecture of our platform as opposed to closed, you know, that technological architectural choice matches the market where actually being able to integrate with different route to market providers for a given fleet of integrated assets makes a lot of sense, right? So that means that we give our customers choice around which data streams can be plugged in and which routes to market they can use without saying, if you use our tech, you have to also use only one optimization algorithm or one trading desk, we can give them choices. So it's putting control back into the hands of the uh, energy businesses that we work with through this open modular architecture we've developed as well. Okay, yeah, I mean, the word open is a very interesting one, isn't it? Because it's sort of, it's irrelevant in the very early days of our market, because there's no one to be open to, but then it suddenly becomes probably the most important thing and the often the determinant of success as the market takes off. So, um, so can you just, can we just get a bit geeky for a moment? So, so I'm an energy pl player in some way, I, I bought origami energy software, and I've deployed it for my own uses. Can you just sort of paint a picture of of how I would be using it? What's it actually doing day to day? What kind of assets? I mean, pick, pick some real examples if you can, you know, battery systems or, or some, something, you know, to really sort of paint a, 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 a sort of tangible picture of, a, of a, for instance, uh, of a customer deployment. Sure. So, so maybe I'll give you a couple of examples. One maybe with uh, a battery and the other one uh, with maybe more from an asset centric uh, mm -hmm. actor's perspective and maybe the other one more uh, renewables like around solar or wind and maybe from the, the market actor's perspective, the, the yeah. trade or the route to market. Yeah, because I'm they're, interested they're, particularly with solar. I mean, presumably solar just generates if the sun's shining. <laughs> I'm not sure yeah, what, what, what management you can do on it. So I'm it, interested. It, anyway. it's, more, it's more interesting than, than you might think. Yeah, um, tell me. So, 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 so the battery version first. So um, some of our customers are uh, right now um, uh, developing and building out increasingly large fleets of batteries. So there's a, there's a wall of infrastructure money interested in investing in the next big thing and batteries and energy storage generally of different durations is seen as the next big thing because if you've got increasingly green energy systems they need physical flexibility to be balanced and one way of doing that is obviously with energy storage so if you've got this renewables dominated world you need batteries and other forms of energy storage uh, in the system so our, our customer in this case is a, a big battery storage developer. They're building out tens and hundreds and then even more megawatts of batteries connected to the grid, either in the middle of nowhere, you know, in a farmer's field connected to the grid network, or actually even behind the meter, co-located with load or even other renewables on the roof of the factory or a wind farm on that industrial site. So, so that battery can needs to make money uh, to pay for itself. If someone's going to you know, raise millions and millions and spend it on building out these batteries, they have to, you know, make enough money to pay back the loans in a sense or the equity, however it was financed. And, and so it needs to be monetized uh, in, in a way which delivers the returns that are expected. And batteries are quite different from things like solar or a, a more sort of uh, 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 an asset which just kind of does what it does. Batteries need to be dynamically uh, managed and controlled, not passively monitored, you know. Um, so, so you need to decide, are you going to rev it up and down? Are you going to let it sit there and do nothing and wait half an hour and then do something in the future? So deciding whether it should be charged, discharged, or do nothing for some option value in the future is absolutely critical. So what our tech platform does is, you know, help monitor what is that battery doing right now? So there's real-time data associated with 
it's state of charge, it's discharge or charge rate, you know, what is it actually doing? And, 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 and because energy, energy flexibility, like batteries, the, the, the seconds, in fact, the milliseconds really matter. So the dynamic speed of what you're doing is not measured in months or, you know, the calendar, it's, it's measured really, really real time in, 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 in hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds. So gone are the days of the national grid sending each other faxes about what they wanted to do. Yeah. yeah the, okay. the pigeons faxes, post-it notes, and, you know, yeah. it, they don't cut it anymore. You need really, really high speed, uh, increasingly autonomous uh, software behind the scenes. And that's what we do for a living. So the battery needs to be monitored. It needs to be dynamically managed. So, and then there needs to be some sort of decision making around what is the best thing to do every second of the day to be monetized, which value pool to use the jargon. Are you trying to balance the system physically for national grid and try make money from ancillary services? Are you trying to balance things and things like the balancing mechanism? Or are you trying to trade in the wholesale markets within day or day ahead or further, depending on the the market actors hedging strategy, et cetera. So looking at those different pools of value and then uh, adjusting the battery's um, uh, control strategy accordingly is a complicated thing you need to do and you need to change what you're doing all the time or at least reconsider it all of the time. So, so what we do is we, our customer is typically the battery project developer, owner operator, but we also have integrations, interfaces with routes to market, market actors that might have their own optimization algorithms. They might be trying to figure out themselves how they should be trading in the wholesale markets or uh, uh, offering the capacity to national grid for dynamic containment or something else. So, so quite often the other end of the technology is uh, a route to market actor, a trader, an optimizer, and, and maybe more than one. And that's the thing is over time, uh, these fleets of batteries, quite often, the portfolios are being parceled up with different elements of the portfolio with different routes to market. So the, 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 there's an increasingly fluid picture with the off takers that are trading the capacity, but our technology is sticky for the long haul. So our technology gets used for years and years into the future. In fact, we've started signing up our first you know, really long-term multi-year agreements, where, which is much longer duration than the commercial contracts with particular trading companies providing the monetization. So the, the, it's been a bit, a bit of a flip where you used mm. to have really long-term PPAs and technology was sort of an afterthought. And now we're starting to sign very long-term technology agreements where actually the, 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 the route to monetization is much more fluent and transient. Really interesting. So, so I can see that you're, you're taking a, a feed of the state of the battery and, and, you're, and you're controlling the battery, and then you're taking feeds from other, other, other information in what, in my mind at least, is all a bit like a sort of market trading situation in that you're taking signals which could almost sound like pricing signals from, from other sources. But presumably, prediction is a big part of how to play that game well it, 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 things like the weather forecast and uh, what what how consumers are going to behave when they're going to plug their evs in tonight and all that sort of stuff is it christmas you know um are you is that stuff happening on your platform or is that stuff that's being done by other services around you and you just plug into it yeah so, so you've raised two great points both of which are you know absolutely core to what we do in in different kind of layers of the overall offering so so, so the one of the most basic things that you must underestimate how historically it wasn't done at all, and now it's, it, it, it needs to be done for reasons that I'm sure you're, you're well aware, is that historically physical data used to sit over here somewhere and usually sort of an engineer's role in kind of the world of operations, quite often just a separate business or business unit. And then financial data associated with trades on exchanges was in its own world. And then contractual data with things like a, a customer's tariff on site behind the meter or a PPA if it's front of the meter, you know, the, the, the physical financial and contractual data was all over the place. It was in fundamentally different formats. It certainly wasn't interoperable. So one thing that our platform does is take in those different types of data and then kind of orchestrate it, process it, transform it to be useful. <laughs> so then you can build applications on top of that transformed data from physical sources, from financial sources, from contractual sources, having, having choreographed that data, that orchestration layer, can then you can then build applications on top of it. So then figure out, are you gonna build some really powerful forecast on top of those data streams? You're using some machine learning algorithm or maybe a trading strategy on the back of that forecast. 
how you're going to hop between value pools. So we typically try and develop a, a starter kit for some of that intelligence. But a lot of our customers end up wanting to develop their own algo, their own particular forecast, their own proprietary secret sauce, if you will. So, so we ingest the data, process and orchestrate the data, build some of the initial applications, but in a way that the customer can then bring their own differentiation over time. They can develop their own secret sauce, but using this kind of standard modular software architecture that we built from the ground up. Yeah, interesting. Now the metaphor that's come into my head is that of uh, Salesforce, which was the, the first SaaS platform. And it seems like what they did very well was help create a, con a con common schema that the customer would implement their first thing, it might just be CRM or, or some, something else. But because it's a common schema, all the apps can then be plugged in effectively and talk to each other. And there's huge layers of value that can be built on top of that. Um, yeah, yeah we're, fascinating. We're, it, it's, a, it's not a poor analogy. You know, we're, okay, we're, we're, you. we're shamelessly borrowing from different industries that have transformed themselves digitally. And yeah. that's certainly one of them. Great. So we're in danger of, I mean, there's so much fascinating stuff to talk about here. We're in danger of, uh, of getting, uh, you know, going deeper and deeper, but we have to, we have to move on. So you mentioned, we talked about batteries. Is the solar case slightly different? Yeah, it, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll look through the lens of, uh, of an off taker. So some of our customers are off takers and traders and route to market providers, again, using the same underlying modular uh, software platform, but for their own use case, mm -hmm. in particular, things like uh, risk management, imbalance management. So there, if I played the tape for you, a day in the life of that customers, they would have signed up potentially a few years ago um, to be the off-taker of a large solar farm, or in fact, many different solar farms uh, across the country. And uh, they would have been, uh, they had agreed some sort of commercial contract, a PPA with different price mechanisms in it. Uh, and they would have probably got also a forecast probably in a PDF uh, or maybe even a physical sheet of paper from that project developer those years ago when they built the thing. And then they built a series of four trades in their hedging strategy potentially years in advance based on those, by definition, static historical forecasts of, you know, it's sunnier in the summer than it is in the winter and all those kinds of things. You know, so, and then they have to deal with the real world when the real time markets matter. So eventually, uh, they have to manage their position as a trader in real time because the system price is moving up and down. They probably have not one, but maybe a hundred different PPAs they're managing simultaneously. So as is their own trading book, you know, long or short, are they in or out of balance on a particular uh, asset, a particular PPA, which might have many assets or across many PPAs across their entire trading book. So, our, so that customer of ours would be able to build their own virtual power plant, their own groupings, of assets by geography, by contract, by asset type. And then they can decide using our software tooling how they want to be managing things like imbalance risk. You know, they thought the wind was going to be blowing by the forecast they were given, you know, a year ago. In fact, it's not blowing. So the, the four trades they put in are now not right. So they need to fix them. And then the choice is do they fix it purely financially, you know, placing trades in markets, or if they have access to physical flexibility as part of the portfolio, going back to the batteries, hmm. they may choose to flex something physically. So if you're a market actor, you used to think in a completely isolated way between the financial world of trading and the physical world of energy flexibility and dispatch, our software can make those financial and physical choices look identical. You know, If I want to fix an imbalance, do I do it financially, pulling that lever, or do I do it physically with dispatching a physical asset like a battery. So our software can make those things look completely interoperable. And that's the way you, in a modern 21st century way, manage a, a clean energy trading book. Fascinating. Now, now the analogy that's coming to my head is I, um, I heard a very interesting talk by the CTO of McLaren Racing a few years ago about how the way you win a race is you don't react to things kind of uh, during the race because you don't have time to. What you do is you plan what you're going to do for every possible outcome. And then as the race unfolds millisecond by millisecond, everything's telemetry, you know, full of telemetry and so on. 
you already know what you're going to do when the tire bursts or the whatever. Well, <laughs> the tire bursts, you're probably screwed. But uh, you, you know, um, so depending, you know, on exactly what's happening with engine temperatures and tire wear and all that sort of stuff, you know, it's all set up and it's just it's just running. And I suppose even with the biggest uh, computers in the world applied to the problem, we still can't predict the wind or the, or the clouds um, as uh, you know to the hyper local um resolution and and so uh yeah i mean suddenly a cloud can go over a solar farm in a few seconds and um uh, no one knew that was going to happen so um yeah I, I i that's a really really interesting picture and 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 i guess the 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 thing that we've got good at as a technology company what i think what our customers really value is being able to ingest physical data from assets real time and quite often from somebody else's tech platform some sort of grid edge system which is monitoring you know SCADA systems or some other mm. behind the meter load or generation profiles. So quite often we're tapping somebody else's API, not necessarily going all the way to the asset themselves, but then we're combining it with third party weather feeds or even somebody else's forecast. Yeah. Because like you say, th th they want to set up a bunch of commercial rules well in advance and then take action potentially faster than the human beings sitting in the trading desk can even cope with. Um, mm -hmm. so, so you're right. And, and, and one insight I've had, and I've had to temper my own technological enthusiasm, my own geekery, is even relatively simple if then type rules are very valuable in this world. You don't need super complicated stuff necessarily, but you do need things grounded in the commercial reality of so what are the commercial terms I signed in that contract? What is the asset actually doing? What is the system price doing? And if certain conditions uh, prevail, then you flip strategy from fishing in that value pool to that value pool. So some of the beginnings of getting going can be like a stairway to heaven, can be actually quite foundational, quite simple. And then over the a multi-month relationship with another party, you can add more and more layers of increasingly sophisticated functionality. So we found that almost everybody we work with wants to walk before they run. Yeah, no, again, that really resonates with what we do at Device Pilot. Obviously, we're managing devices rather than managing energy, but the, you know, people sometimes say, oh, can you do AI? Can you do machine learning? And we're like, well, what exactly do you mean by that? <laughs> do you have enough training data? Or all those kind of questions. And actually, it usually turns out that that you, you get a lot of the gain for some relatively simple automation. Um, and, and in fact, even understand, even codifying what you want to happen to meet your SLA or whatever it is, is actually most of the work. Um, it, it, uh, it, it, it is. And the other trend I guess we're seeing, just like you've just alluded to, is there's beginning to be quite an exciting ecosystem of different technology-based solutions and actually trying to do everything yourself is not only crazy, but it'll, it'll be too slow and too expensive, but there are other people doing specialist bits really, really well. So we've adopted a more partnering approach yeah. with specialist forecasting providers or specialist mm -hmm. uh, meter reading companies or you know, battery management systems. We're quite often tapping into a lot of third-party uh, data feeds or tech platforms in order to deliver a whole solution to the customer which they would otherwise have to manage 20 different point solutions and their head would explode. So actually making it easy and abstracting away some of that complexity is one of the, one of the reasons that customers work with us. Yeah, interesting. I, I have noticed that the national grid in the UK, and in fact, many countries now, publishes forecasts of carbon intensity uh, sort of day ahead and, and that kind of stuff, which is um, really quite interesting. I mean, we're used to weather forecasts, but now we have all these other kinds of forecasts. Um, Presumably, you can not only just ingest that, you can also affect it. So I can imagine that. You, you, you uh, can affect it. Way. Mm. Yeah, you, you can maybe optimize based on prices or optimize based on mm. carbon intensity, depending if you're you know, really trying to deliver on an ESG mandate uh, or hitting your net yeah. zero obligations above all else or uh, uh, just chasing prices. And they're becoming related, right? When the, mm. the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, there's probably quite a lot of green energy on the system. And so prices might go down. So these things are becoming quite correlated if you look at the, you know, the, the, the market science. Mm. Well, that's quite encouraging to hear you say that, isn't it? I mean, it's a little bit like we've been with COVID, we've been wondering about whether we should look after people's health or look after the economy. And I think eventually people realise that it's the same thing. And, and it sounds like the same thing here. You know, should we be green or should we make money? Actually, it could be the same thing. Fantastic. So um, just to wrap up, uh, could you just sort of look forwards 
three, four, five years for origami, kind of what, what does the world look like for you ideally? Where are you, where are you trying to get to? What are you trying to be? What, what role in the, in the market? And, and then as a kind of follow up to that, what, um, what kind of obstacles do you need to overcome to get there? So what are some things that need to happen in, in the next few years for that to, to come true? Yeah, so I mean, our ambition is ultimately to become you know, the world's leading independent technology platform for the green energy sector. You know, uh, we're a really ambitious uh, business uh, and, and we're now a few years in and we've raised you know, 50 million pounds and we have great backers behind us. So I think that's now a credible dream, whereas before it was just a dream. Now we've got the foundations laid in terms of the team, the capital, and also the, the, the customer base. So we've now signed up a bunch of truly global businesses where we're focusing on our initial deployments in our backyard here in the UK. But part of that next five years is to be uh, globalizing the solution across all of our customers' international operations. So going from uh, proving out the model uh, close to home, but because the, the foundations we've laid are, are architecturally truly global is to then spread our wings and, and really go for it. So that'll be one facet of our journey over the next five years is, 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 is globalizing the solution across our existing and future customers. I think the next is um, uh, is more kind of the external reflection of what the market itself is going to be doing. You know, the 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 the, the shift to green energy is now unstoppable. Thank goodness. You know, yeah. <laughs> and and now it's not seen as some sort of compromise with the economic considerations. It's finally aligned. So the capital markets, public opinion, technology, and regulation and policy are all finally pointing basically yep. in the same it feels direction, like right? We're, we're getting, we're just over the hump, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean it's yep. easy, but at least yep. you're not trying to push water uphill or yep. fight against the machine, right? So, 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 so I think that's, that's one thing as an entrepreneur, right? It's all partly about timing and, you know, have you called your market timing right? Are you too early, too late? So it feels like as a business, we've got our are a powerful team together, a group of great blue chip customers, great financial backers and enough money, just at the point where these tipping points are being reached in the market where we can really go for it. So that's partly why I'm excited about the next five years is those foundations have been laid, we now have some tailwinds and now we can really go for it. Yeah, so that all sounds fantastic. And I can see there's lots of great execution you need to do. So that's kind of a risk. But are there any other ex sort of externalities? I'm thinking sort of legislation or technology or things other companies need to do to help make all that that true that you, you know, you're somewhat reliant on and, and you need to, you know, you need to happen to make that picture come true. Yeah, so I, I think um, one thing we're doing is we're standing on the shoulders of giants, technologically speaking. So we're using, you know, super powerful tools and hosting and cloud solutions that uh, people have built over the last 10 or pl plus years in other use cases. So uh, that's one thing that we're the indirect beneficiaries of this technological boom around the world, which is amazing. And then the second thing, and I touched on partnering, over the next five years, we're already beginning to see some uh, other tech platforms really get to scale around very specialist use cases. So one thing I think we're gonna need to get really good at as a business is, is, is partnering, uh, not you know, in the traditional sense with your customer and adding value, but actually just finding ways to do less and do it better, mm. knowing that other uh, friends in the broadly defined ecosystem are really nailing in an amazing way their own particular use cases. So one of them will be around just reading lots and lots of little data streams from individual solar panels, wind farms, batteries, EVs, you name it. There's going to be millions of individual assets, each generating real-time streams of data. Um, there, are, there are platforms scaling on the back of that that we can then tap into and read for our own particular use cases. Mm. Similarly, the world of, of, of forecasting, prognostics, predictions around, you know, is the turbine getting a bit rattly? Do I think I need to take it offline in two weeks? You know, building you know, a commercial strategy around that suddenly is credible because someone else is worrying about the details of turbine maintenance. So there are use cases all over the place that we're beginning to see being really professionalized and scaled with really 21st century software solutions where we can interface without doing tons of bespoke software development. You know, these are interfaces by design. So, so that's giving me a bit more hope that we can focus and kind of accelerate by forming links with other specialist tech companies that do other bits of our overall offering. 
Fascinating. Well, Peter, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a tour de force sort of uh, tour of the market. Uh, I think you've painted a very clear picture of what, uh, what you intend to do uh, and what you hope the market will do around you and the whole ecosystem uh, boots up. And, and it sounds as though you're a place to play a very important role in the centre of that all. Thank you so much for your time today. It's my absolute pleasure, Pilgrim. Take care.